And good morning. As we uh, continue our study of the book of Galatians, maybe a good time just to kind of uh, review a little bit. I hope you have your Bibles. I want to invite you now just to take your Bibles out and turn with me to the book of Galatians. Many believe this is the oldest book in the New Testament. Um, Theologians believe it was Paul's first writing. And if, if you look at it, you can see he's a little intense. He's a little angry, a little upset when he's writing this letter. And, uh, and so, like a lot of us, um, I think in his other letters, he begins to calm down a little bit. He begins to learn how to maybe communicate a little more clearly. Um, there's a reason he's so upset. And that is uh, he has been sent out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That is his, understand, his understanding. Um, and, and let's kind of set the tone here too. Remember, Paul was on his way to Damascus. We talked a couple of weeks ago, and that's when he had the Damascus Road experience and encountered Christ. And, uh, and so as he's writing this letter, we're some 14 years beyond that. So just to give you a time frame, uh, Paul has spent many years in the desert of Arabia. He has been studying and preparing for this missionary journey. And he has spent some time in conversation with uh, Peter. He tells us about different meetings he's had with Peter, Peter being one of the lead apostles in the early church. And so he understands that his mission is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and Peter is kind of the lead uh, pastor, or the lead person who's going to take the gospel to the Jews. So that's kind of the, the understanding. Now, the reason this letter to Galatia uh, begins to be an issue is, first of all, we need to understand Galatia was not a church per se. Uh, Galatia was a region, an area. We know of at least four churches that were in the region of Galatia. So, uh, uh, so as Paul is taking the gospel to the Gentiles, he's writing this letter to the Galatians, certainly would have been read in all four of these churches, and there may have been more than four churches in the region of Galatia, but we know of at least four. But one of the churches is known by the name of Antioch, and Antioch is where this is, uh, the passage we're going to focus today is really uh, um, going to be the focal point. Now, what's key about Antioch is that in the early church, you remember it started in Jerusalem, they have Pentecost, the Spirit comes, the church begins to spread, goes into Samaria, which was a bit of an issue. A Samaritan was someone who would have been considered like a half Jew, right? And, and so that was a bit of a stumbling block for the Jews and the early church. But taking the gospel to the Gentiles was the big hurdle to get over. And um, Peter's already had, if you, if you uh, read in... Uh, uh, the book of Acts, you'll find that Peter had his encounter with Cornelius, who was a Gentile. That's in Acts 10. We talked about that a little bit on our Wednesday night service. And so Peter has already had God reveal to him in a vision that the gospel is to go to the Gentiles, but they're struggling with, uh, with what that is to look like and what that's to mean. I was so moved by uh, uh, Aaron and Bryce. Didn't they do a great job this morning, the worship team? Outstanding, yeah. And how appropriate... The song that, uh, and, and by the way, Mike, you did a good job too. I just, uh, I could hear you singing back there. But, uh, but Aaron, I love that song when Aaron sang, um, I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Right? Isn't that powerful? And, and, and it got me thinking, that it's, it's kind of set up the message, that that Aaron would be like, if you could picture a worship service at Antioch. And, uh, and Aaron's on the worship team and she's singing in Antioch and she's saying, I am a child of God. Yes, I am. A, a proclamation of having received the gospel. Because you see in the church at Antioch, a couple of interesting things happen there. Scripture tells us that followers of Christ were first called Christians at the church in Antioch. That's significant. And here's one reason I think why. The church in Antioch is the first church that appears to be made up of equal parts Jew and Gentile. You see, up to this point, the church had primarily been Jewish followers who had come to recognize the Messiah and began to follow Christ. But at Antioch, something new is breaking forth. And it is a church that's going to be made up of both Jew and Gentile. And here's where the problem comes in. As Paul's preaching this gospel, the Jewish, some of the Jewish people, they become known as Judaizers or some of the circumcision party. Uh, they were the ones who believed that before you could become a follower of Christ, before you could become a Christian, you had to first become a Jew, all right? Because all of them had been Jews, so now they're trying to figure out what does it mean for Gentiles to come into the church, 
That's why last week we talked about Paul's passage in uh, chapter 1, verse 10, where he says, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. The accusation that's being leveled against Paul is that you're just trying to water down the gospel. You're, you're trying to water it down in such a way that, uh, that, that you're trying to please people. And they were trying to say circumcision was required now, I don't want to get into circumcision, but let me just say it would certainly be a church growth hindrance, right? I mean, it's kind of a little bit of an issue if you're going to demand circumcision. You could see how that would impact uh, uh, church growth, right? I mean, Paul, so, so what Paul's trying to say, the passage we're going to look at is where he confronts Peter. As Paul begins to defend not only his calling, as he reminds people that he did not receive his gospel from any man. He did not receive it from any person. What Paul is saying is Jesus himself revealed this gospel to me, not only on the road to Damascus, but, but he would imply that his time in Arabia and the desert, that God was speaking to him, preparing his heart, giving him the gospel. And so as Paul boldly proclaims the gospel, he, he wants to make it very clear that we are justified, we are made right with Christ through faith. It's not our works. And there are those in Jerusalem who are trying to say, no, 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 you're watering it down. They've, they've got to become a Jew first and then they can become a follower of Christ. So that's the issue that we're dealing with in this letter. And uh, there's so many good things we're going to see as we move forward. Paul's going to talk about, because some of the concern is, well, if you don't make people abide by the law, then, then they won't, right? So we're going to get into some issues later in the coming chapters about freedom and what it means to be led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, to experience the freedom that is ours in Christ. So let's begin, uh, focus on a passage in chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, as Paul writes to the churches in Galatia, on the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted. Now they, he's talking about, is the Jerusalem uh, leadership, some of the, the leaders in the Jerusalem church. They recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised Gentiles, just as Peter had been uh, to the circumcised Jews. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and Cephas is just another name for, for Peter, um, and John, those esteemed as pillars in the church, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I'd been eager to do all along. Basically, they're saying, don't forget to remember the poor. I'm very much a part of the, of the Jewish message and certainly the message of Christ is to remember the poor. And I just highlight that last week, you know, we took an offering up uh, for, uh, for David Oginga who spoke with us and shared uh, his story, his testimony. And we continue to support that work uh, there in some of the, the poorest uh, slums in the world. Uh, Paul reminds us, don't forget the poor. God has called us. He spreads his gifts to the poor by giving them to us that we might follow the example of Christ and, uh, and share the blessing that God's given to us to others. And so he's talking about uh, when Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Whoa, <laughs> pretty strong language. We see the boldness of Paul here saying, you know, Peter was recognized. He was like the apostle. Uh, he was the one, remember, who stood up and preached on the day of Pentecost and over 3,000 coming to the church. I mean, Peter was recognized as the leader in the church. And Paul here saying, I opposed him to his face. Why? Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Let's stop there just a moment and talk about what we mentioned last week about people pleasing. How often people pleasing can get us in trouble. And Paul basically saying in his life, when he was trying to follow the law in Judaism, he basically is confessing now as he gets perspective. Look, He's saying, I was caught up in people pleasing. There was no way I could be a servant of Christ because I was trying to please all the people. I was keeping score as to how I was doing in comparison with other people. 
and trying to please and meet the expectations and the demands of other people. How many of you know what it's like to get caught up in that kind of thing? Very easy in our culture to lose sight of what it even means to be a follower of Christ and to get caught up in simply trying to please people. And I'm telling you, if we're not careful, church is a terrible environment for that to happen. Sometimes church creates an environment that just thrives on that. And we become so focused and consumed with with trying to please the demands of everybody, we lose sight of the whole mission that God has called us to. And that's why Paul is so passionate here. He's saying we can't lose sight of the vision, the mission that God has sent us on. And now we see another leader in the church, Peter, struggling with the same thing. Basically, here's here's what's going on. Peter's already had his encounter with Cornelius. If you know the Acts 10 story, he's already, uh, God has already uh, lowered the sheet, you know, in the vision for him. He saw and he said, take and eat. Peter's already gone into the house of Cornelius. He's already recognized that God clearly wants to take the gospel to the Gentiles. No question. And now he is here with Paul in Antioch and and they're sharing the gospel and he's eating with the Gentiles, which is a huge barrier that he as a Jew now has overcome. He's no longer caught up in those ridiculous, absurd little Jewish kinds of laws that kept them separate. He understands that Jesus has broke down that dividing wall and that they are one. But there's only one problem. Some of the folks in the leadership in the church in Jerusalem have heard about what's going on in Antioch. Word has finally gotten there, and so they've sent some people to go check it out. Go find out what's going on at Antioch. And and Peter knows enough about who these individuals are. He knows the position that they're going to take. And so all of a sudden, as they arrive, you can imagine, it's like Peter's over here eating with the Gentiles. They're laughing, ah, having a great time. And then they arrive, and all of a sudden, he, he pulls away. Anybody ever experienced something like that? All of a sudden notice that when somebody else arrives, you know, uh, maybe, maybe you're at a party or hanging out with some folks, just having some fellowship, good time, and all of a sudden somebody else arrives and now they treat you differently. You're like, wait a second, what, what happened there? What, what? And all of a sudden you realize it's because of the presence of these other people that Peter gets pulled back into some stuff. And he starts trying to please people. And he starts trying to think, I don't know, how should I handle this? And it just sends Paul through the roof. (laughs) I mean, Paul gets really upset. So much so, he calls Peter out. Now, that's some boldness right there. Because you are calling out the primary leader of the church. And you're saying, Peter, you're in the wrong. Here's what I hope we can take from today's message. If we can learn anything from this passage, it's simply this. Everybody messes up. Everybody messes up. I want you to turn to somebody around you and just say, everybody messes up. Just tell them, just make that proclamation, right? (laughs) Everybody messes up, right? Well, how's that feel? A little bit like that's good news, right? Just now some of you had to confess to your, your spouse and you're like, I don't know, pastor, help me out. Help me out (laughs) to throw me a life raft. (laughs) But it's true. And we get reminded that right here in this passage, Peter, this incredible leader messed up. And by his own admission, he would agree messed up. And I'm going to go so far as to say, as we unpack this passage, we're going to find that Paul messes up too. Maybe not quite as much, but let's face it, a mess up is a mess up. What we have here is probably both of them struggling to understand what God would have them do and to live out their calling. And so what I'd like for us to talk about in the context of this message is what does it mean to love others enough to confront when folks are messing up? Wow, this is a tough one. Because in our culture, it seems like we've decided just to give people a a pass, right? We don't even want to talk about, we feel like that's not a place to venture into. And I want to be very clear. I think we should only step into these conversations after we have prayed and feel led by the Spirit. Very important. Because you cannot help a brother or sister in need if you come in with a judgmental, condemning attitude. 
And that's part of Paul's problem here. He's so upset. He's so angry. The fact that he's being charged and accused the way he is, he gets a little bit defensive. And so hopefully we can learn some from some from his mistakes uh, as to how to love people enough to confront when there needs to be confrontation. I said last week, confrontation is the gift that no one wants, but it is a gift. And, and if we're going to be a healthy body of believers, we need to confront one another. You see, confrontation, if we think of the body of Christ, confrontation is the immunity system within the body of Christ. It is what stands up against the viruses. And can I, can I tell you what a big virus in the church is? Gossip. It's not just in the church. It's, it's clearly in our culture. But nothing good ever comes from gossip. Gossip is just, uh, is just a virus, right? And, 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 and until we stand up and confront it, we're not going to be as healthy as we could be. And so when we think about what's going on here and how we can learn from this, um, these are some points that, that, that God uh, impressed upon my heart as I've thought about. What does it mean to love enough to confront? And the first thing is, I believe it involves expressing concern. Expressing concern. The first thing you got to do is be concerned enough to take note of what's happening. Notice Paul says here, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Why? Because he stood condemned for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now for Paul, this is a big deal because Barnabas was like his best friend. Barnabas was the one who put his arm around Paul's shoulder and ushered him into the church and basically said, hey, let's give this guy a chance. And, and Barnabas was the one who, in fact, when, when the work began to happen in Antioch, he went and got Paul, selected him personally and said, Paul would be perfect for this position. And, and, and so Barnabas is like his right hand man. And, and what Paul is saying, he's to be so concerned because he said, Peter's actions are not just affecting uh, Peter, it's affecting all the other leaders. Even Barnabas is being impacted by it. Paul is deeply concerned that others are being led astray, that others are getting caught up in a situation. And I guess the first thing I want to communicate is, church, we have to care. All the way back to the Old Testament, the question, am I my brother's keeper? What's the answer to that question? Yes, <laughs> yes. We have a responsibility to help look out for one another. And part of it is to have some concern. So let me just ask you, is there somebody in your life, I want to really bring this home. Is there somebody right now in, in, in your household, in your workplace, uh, someone maybe in, in your neighborhood, someone that you know that God has brought to your attention and you have a concern about Something that's going on in their life. Maybe church is just something as simple as you haven't seen them at church in a while. And, and you're concerned about them. You're, you're wondering, hey, what happened to so-and-so? I, I, uh, they used to be a part of uh, our fellowship or they used to be a part. And, and you have this concern. Now, here's how this works. When you start allowing God to bring to your attention just this concern, the very first thing you need to do with that concern is pray about it. Don't start talking to somebody else about it. Talk to God about it and begin to pray and say, God, help me understand what you want me to do with this concern, how you want to work in me about this concern, because I am concerned about this individual. I'm concerned about their family. I'm concerned about some things that I'm seeing. And, and, and God, help me know what to do with that. First step. Paul saw some things he was very concerned about. And he began to, to speak to that. Now, once you've prayed about it, I want to encourage you to take the next step. If God's really laid it on your heart, then do something with it. Meaning, make that visit. Make that phone call. Write that letter or that card. In other words, somehow find a way to let God take that concern and communicate it to the individual that you're concerned about. I think one of the best examples I've seen of this 
uh, I heard uh, Jenny Artiega read this at, uh, at Kathy Gargas' service. And uh, to the Gargas family, I want to say, I know we did, uh, Jenny talked to you in advance, so you at least were not surprised by this. Uh, but I think it's such an honor for Kathy as we continue to remember her life and her legacy. But Kathy had seen some things that she was concerned about with Jenny. And uh, obviously this is with Jenny's permission as well. Uh, Jenny was able to be here today or she was going to read it. And so I want to read this on her behalf. This is the letter that Kathy uh, sent to, uh, to Jenny. It says, Dear Jenny, I'm sending this to you as a letter. People don't do that anymore, but I need you to know this. I'm crying as I write this because it hurts me so that you don't really understand how wonderful you really are. There's so much I want you to realize about you. You are amazing. You are such a wonderful wife to Philip. You respect and love him very much. I see this. You are a great mom to your three sons. I see this. You are a wonderful aunt, sister, and daughter to people I feel don't appreciate you for who you are and what you do. I see this. You're an amazing friend to all who are willing to meet you halfway. I see this. You are so full of kindness, goodness, caring, and sympathy for those in need. I see this. I see you, Jenny. Don't think that others don't see all of this too. You are one of a kind. You are one of a kind. Now, all of this said, I want you to do one thing better for me. Please take better care of you. Make you a priority for a change. Papa and I love you and your family very much. You are loved. P.S. You looked very beautiful today. I saw you, Kathy. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. I want to I just set that here. Now, that's powerful, right? Powerful. And it comes from someone, I'm convinced as I was preparing for this, obviously God laid that on her heart. And can you not tell how meaningful it was? Jenny had it framed, <laughs> had it painted and framed. That's how much meaning it had. Now, folks, I'm just here to tell you, that's what we're talking about. Having enough concern for someone to take the time to write that encouraging word, to make that call, that visit, to speak those words that can make a difference to someone's life, to let them know, I see you. And I see you in a compassionate, loving way, not a condemning, judgmental way. In other words, it's a difference between see, saying, I see you struggling versus I see you failing. <laughs> right? I see you struggling. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm concerned. Because as we can learn from this passage, we all mess up. Leads us to the second point. It's about explaining truth. Expressing concern and explaining truth. Paul says, when I saw that you were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all. Now, this is the part where I might question Paul. Paul felt the need to say it in front of them all. And I get it in this particular situation because he's trying to not only show concern for Peter and his failings, he's showing concern, obviously, for the, uh, for the people in the Galatian church, for the church there in Antioch, who are being questioned as to whether or not they're truly children of God, whether they're truly saved, whether they've done this right kind of thing. And he's concerned that they not uh, be led astray. So he feels the need to say it in front of them all. In other words, to get Peter to acknowledge publicly that, yes, Paul, you're right. I only say that because in most cases, we're going to discover we can be far more effective in private. Unless it's a situation that requires it to be public, we tend not to have as much success when you confront somebody publicly as when you take the time to come to them uh, in, in, a, in a more private way to talk with them about situation. When we call people out publicly, it feels a lot like uh, social media, right? I mean, it's like, how much, in fact, how many of you would agree with me? Not a lot of good happens when you try to argue with somebody on social media. It's like, I've never quite understood why people, uh, with all the things to do in the world, why, why they waste their time on that. Um, Paul says, 
I called uh, uh, in, in front of them all. You are a Jew. Now notice what he does here is simply explain the truth. He's saying, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. What he's saying is, Peter, even though you are a Jew, you've embraced Jesus like a Gentile would. You're no longer living trying to earn your salvation through the law. You've embraced Jesus. That's what he means by living like a Gentile. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. In other words, he, his argument is basically, as he explains the truth, he's saying, if you realize that that didn't work for you and that Jesus is the answer, why would you force them to go back and be Jews first and follow Jewish customs? Who are, uh, we are who, we <laughs> who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one shall be justified. Paul is explaining the truth. And the Bible says, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings... You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what's happening here in this passage. And when we think about how we can help confront others who have maybe failed in some situation, who are struggling, and again, remember, all of us mess up. The key becomes how to speak the truth. What's the truth people need to hear when you're in the midst of failure and struggles? Well, maybe it's nothing more than God loves you unconditionally. <laughs> that nothing is impossible with God. That God does not give up on you. And as we begin to speak these kinds of truths, that Jesus died on a cross so that we could be forgiven. Helping people unpack the truth in such a way that when they hear it, they can begin to respond positively. It's pretty clear in this passage, the reason Paul is saying this is because on that day in Antioch, Peter did agree. Even though he was called out publicly, Peter heard the truth and clearly sided with Paul and said, you know, you're right. You're right. And it was a turning point in that church so that the, the church could be united and begin to realize that in Christ they could be one, that Jesus had broken down those walls. And when we start thinking about explaining truth, we need to think about what are the truths of God's word that people need to hear when they're struggling, when they feel like a failure. Who in your life right now needs to hear this simple truth that God hasn't given up on you, that God still loves you, that you can be forgiven. That there is hope. There can be a new beginning. That God can heal. That God is the God who heals. These are truths that need to be spoken. That God might begin to work in the hearts and lives of people that they can indeed be set free. That leads us to the next part of it, the very important part of it, extending grace, expressing concern, explaining truth and extending grace. So important that we extend grace to others. In fact, grace should be multiplied in our lives. It's the kind of thing that once we, because you cannot, hear me on this, you cannot extend grace to others until you have known what it is to be the recipient of God's grace. And when you have experienced God's grace in a profound, life-changing way, then God's grace can be multiplied in your life as you begin to extend it into the lives of others. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. Notice that Paul is saying to Peter here and to the Antioch church, uh, you don't set aside God's grace and try to earn it through the law. But sometimes if we're not careful, when it comes to expressing our concern for others, 
we can set aside the grace of God. We set it aside almost like, well, this is not needed right now. What I need right now is a harsh tone. And trust me, I've been there. I know what it is to be concerned about loved ones and want to express that concern and yet seem to set aside the grace of God. My family will sometimes say it, I hear it in your tone, right? Anybody else get that? Your tone doesn't sound very gracious. In fact, Luann's had to learn to extend grace to me uh, a lot, especially when it comes to housework and tasks around the house. I have to remind her occasionally, if a man says he's going to fix something, a man is going to fix it. And they don't have to be reminded every six or eight months about it, you know? <laughs> Just, <laughs> extend some grace. How about in your life? Who do you need to extend some grace to right now? That maybe they're struggling, going through a rough situation, and, and you could jump up on your high horse and be all kind of judgmental and condemning. What does it mean to extend grace? It has everything to do with words, doesn't it? You know, sometimes the way you extend grace is simply by a kind, encouraging word. We celebrated in Kathy's letter. Uh, that's an extension of God's grace. But sometimes if you can't find the kind, encouraging words to say, you know how you can extend grace? No words. How many of you know sometimes the most gracious thing you can do is stay silent? As the Bible teaches, there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. I, I want you to know I struggled with that for years because I thought it said there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. Silent come first. <laughs> there's a time to be silent. Check that one first. And then there's a time to speak if God has given you a kind, gracious word because that's how you extend grace. I know how we need grace in our community, in our culture, in our world. My goodness, look at the condition of our world. Nobody seems to have grace for anybody anymore. How many of you know that we live in a world where people just seem to be looking for a reason to twist someone's words and try to capture them in something? It's, it's clearly a part of our larger culture. God help us not have it be a part of our church culture. Extend grace. Forgive. Sometimes the most, uh, the best way that you can extend grace is simply letting it go. Let it go. And so I ask you again, as we think about helping one another, extending grace to one another, where are the places in your life where God would say to you, let it go? Proverbs 19, 11 says, a person's wisdom gives them patience. It is to their glory to overlook an offense. What would it mean to just simply overlook that offense, to let it go, to extend grace? And that leads us to the final point. It's about expecting good expecting good. I want to take you to the end of the book now in Galatians chapter 6. The reason I say I think Paul learned some things from this, having told us about calling Peter out, notice we get to chapter 6 and Paul says this, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? I think best understood to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the law of Christ. He said you could sum it all up in those two statements. So he says, if you want to fulfill the law of Christ, carry each other's burdens. We are our brother's keepers. Let's help one another out. And then he says later in that passage, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. <laughs> 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Expecting good. And here's why you can expect good. If God is the one that called it to your attention and the love of Christ in your heart is what compelled you to express concern about someone's need, then you're already on the right track. And you let God speak to you the truth that they need to hear so you can unpack for them the truth that'll help set them free. And then you begin to extend that grace. And the reason you can expect good is because just like in the very beginning when God was creating, when God's word was speaking, every time God created, he said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. We can expect good to come from these situations because God is the one who is at work and he's calling forth that which is good. You see, it is true. We all mess up. But God is in the business of turning our messes into a message. And I pray that today, the fact that Peter messed up could somehow be meaningful and significant to you. Because all these many years later, God took Peter's mess turned it into a message that can make a difference in your life. If you've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I would love to talk to you about that today. If you have a concern that God's impressed on your heart that you'd like to pray about, just know that our pastoral staff, Pastor Brandon's here, Pastor Nick, myself, Pastor Matt there in the back, we'd be happy to pray with you. Any of our ushers, in fact, could help lead you to a place. May we pray and lift up these concerns. And my prayer is that God will take his word and begin to make a difference in the lives of people who right now, throughout our community, are struggling, maybe even questioning, does anybody care? May the Spirit of God move in and through us. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the opportunity to present your word. I do pray, God, that you'd give us wisdom and guidance that as you impress upon our hearts people that, that you're concerned about and you want to show your concern through us, God, may we know what it is to be led by your Spirit. That as we approach others, it would be with your love, your love that compels us, not with judgmental or condemning thoughts, but with compassion and concern. And God, we pray that your word would not return void. That as we trust in you and as we love enough to confront, that you would bring good out of it for your honor and your glory. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.